Hi, this is John Buck, back again for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and in today's video, we're going to talk about the properties of the Discrete Time Fourier series, specifically what happens when we do things like shift signals or convolve signals, how the time domain representation and the frequency domain representation of the Fourier series are interconnected. And this is a deep, important idea, uh, and, and it's maybe useful having a, a little prop here to, to talk about uh, how to think of the Fourier series. If I think of, of taking a, a block of wood, you could say if I take this block of wood and rotate it, I get two different perspectives on the same underlying block of wood. It turns out in the same way, the Fourier series is a way to get two different perspectives on the same underlying signal. I can think about it in the time domain as a weighted sum of delayed and shifted impulses, or I can think of that same signal as a weighted sum of complex exponentials. So again, we'll uh, look at these a bunch of properties today and see that, that these two representations are connected though. Remembering this is like a recipe for making the signal, uh, that this weighted sum of exponentials. It says, well, of course, if we change the recipe, we're going to have some inf effect on the signal. And similarly, if we change the signal, it's got to change the recipe. And so it's also good to have in mind our, our com uh, conceptual model is that in the time domain, we're thinking about signals as a weighted sum of delayed impulses. But when we go to, instead of thinking at one sample at a time in the time domain, when we go to frequency with the Fourier series, we're thinking of things as a weighted sum of complex exponentials. And so, for example, to, to show one more of my little, uh, my first Fourier, Fourier blocks here, uh, every, every child should have a set. If I take this underlying square wave that we saw in one of the earlier videos as an example, by taking the Fourier series, it was like changing the perspective and say, well, if I think about things one harmonic at a time, these are the weights for the harmonics. And so these are two different ways of looking at the same signal, just as underneath, as I turn it, we're, we're looking at two sides of the same block of wood. When we take the Fourier series, we're looking at two different sides of the same, uh, same signal. So we'll see that there's, there's a common set of these properties we use a lot. And, and while it's useful to be able to derive them, and I'll probably put up some other videos later showing where some of these come from, what's more important is to be able to recognize them, use them, and to see common themes that, that show up in them, because we'll see uh, sort of variations on these same properties again and again. So again, for the discrete time Fourier series properties, we're going to uh, talk a lot today. If we have a couple signals, x of n is made from the recipe a sub k, Right, so I have the Fourier synthesis sum here. And similarly, y of n has coefficients b sub k. We're going to assume these two signals both have the same period. So we're going to assume they both have the period equal to n. And so we have the same fundamental frequency for both. And we're going to use th these signals. We, x of n and a sub k are not equal, but they have a one-to-one -one relationship. Right? We sometimes say they correspond to each other. And we're going to use a shorthand to represent that relationship for today's is we're going to say that a sub k is the Fourier series of x of n. We have this back and forth arrow saying there's a one-to-one -one mapping between them and that that mapping is the Fourier series. So we could say similarly, rather than write out lots of sums like this, because we're using the same Fourier series sums over and over again, we can write this as a shorthand saying that y of n has Fourier series coefficients b sub k. So let's get on to the properties now. And again, actually, to, to talk about the full set of properties, again, we'll have our a sub k for x of n and our b sub k for y of n. And we're going to, and a few of these properties need a third signal. So we'll call that f of, I'm sorry, s of n with a, a, a Fourier series c sub k. So the first property says, well, what happens if I scale and add two signals in time? Mm -hmm. It turns out one of the things that makes the Fourier series hugely useful is that it is a linear transformation. So that the Fourier series C of k for s, the new Fourier series, is just the same weights and sums on the Fourier series coefficients of the first two signals. So I have a times a sub k plus b times b sub k. So that's the, we call this as the, uh, the linearity property. Uh, similarly, or not similarly, going on to the next property, we can say, well, one of the things we do with signals a lot is we delay them. Right? We, if we delay a signal in time, what happens to the corresponding recipe? Well, it turns out if I delay a signal in time, I end up taking the Fourier series coefficients and multiplying them by a complex exponential that is e to the minus jk 
omega naught times the amount of the delay. And so I take the, the exponential, the, the Fourier series coefficients, and they get, we say, sometimes say modulated by e to the minus j k omega naught m. And interestingly enough, if I shift and say, well, what if I, instead of shifting in the time side, I shift in the frequency domain. I shift the coefficients by m. I get a very, a, a strangely similar thing, that the new series in time will also be multiplying by a complex exponential. Oops, but not with a k there, but rather the, that k becomes the amount of the shift. So I have e to the j capital M omega naught times n times the original time signal. So this is actually a very interesting thing. If I shift in time, I multiply by a complex exponential in, in the Fourier series or frequency. And if I shift in the Fourier series, I multiply by a complex exponential in time. And the only actual difference is this, the, the change in the sign of the exponent and which thing is still a, a free variable here. And so, again, this is sometimes, th these combined properties are sometimes called the shifting or modulation properties. And it's sort of a, an interesting uh, crossover that they have the same structure, but uh, different variables. But at a conceptual level, they're very similar. That's not an accident. We'll see that over and over again, both with these properties, that, that property that they sort of a, a crossover like this. They say, well, well, if I can switch them around, most of the big picture stuff stays the same. The big picture name for that is some, an important idea called duality. And we'll see this show up several times this semester in, in general form with this idea that, that at the high conceptual level, these things have the same property. Uh, the next property we should talk about is another very important one, which says, if I take two periodic signals and convolve them over one period, right? So I take the sum over one period of x of r, y of n to the minus r, and get a new signal from that. Well, it turns out that signal's Fourier series will be the product of the Fourier series of the two input signals. So I have a sub k and b sub k here with this extra multiple scaling factor of n to make the bookkeeping work out. But the big picture here is saying convolution in time is multiplication in frequency. And not, and the, and also we say, well, what if I just multiply two signals in time? What if I just take them and, and multiply them together sample by sample? Well, then it turns out that I get convolution in frequency. So the C sub K will be N times the sum, as I'll use, uh, let's say little L is my sum. So I take the sum over one period of A sub L, B to the K, or b sub k minus l. So this is a convolution sum of the Fourier series coefficients. So again, we see that duality representation. Convolution in time is multiplication in frequency, and multiplication in time is convolution in frequency. So again, these, these uh, duality ideas keep showing up. And so again, these are, are we can think of this pair as sort of the convolution multiplication properties for the Fourier series. And then the other one that's important that, we, that comes up a lot are symmetry properties, which is if we have a real x of n, if the signal in time domain is real, which many of the signals we work with are, like uh, recordings of my voice right now, or, or time series of, of, of uh, fish caught or whatever, we can look at, oop, wrong color, we can look at the Fourier series and we'll show that we can see that that the Fourier series has what we call conjugate even symmetry. That for real signals, A of K is equal to the conjugate of E to the minus K. And so again, the, the fancy name for this is we say this signal is conjugate even. And sort of a, a related, not quite exact dual, but a related property going the other direction is if we have a real X of N, if I take, in general, A sub K would be a, a uh, a um, complex quantity, but if I take just the real part of that complex value thing and get B sub K and then inverse Fourier series, what it turns out on this side is that the time signal I end up with will be the even part of X of N. That is, I take X of N, flip it, and add it to itself, and divide it by half, right? We saw uh, in an earlier chapter, some people like to write this as X E of N. So this is the Fourier series here. Make myself a little more 
room here and pull this stuff down. Similarly, if I take the imaginary part of the Fourier series and say, well, that gives me a, a, a new B sub K, I plug that into the recipe and say, what signal do I get? Well, it turns out that's the odd part of X of N. Right, or sometimes written X sub O of N. I guess now that I pulled this down, I actually have room to say, just as a reminder, the even part is what I get if I take X of N and multiply it or add it to itself and then scale by, add it to a flipped version of itself and scale by a half. This works for the real part. If, even if the signal isn't real, I get an extra conjugate here. But to keep things simple for today, we're going to assume the time signal is real. And similarly, we get for the odd signal, we can say this is one half of what we get for x of n minus x of minus n. Right, so those are, are the, 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 some of the symmetry properties that, that we'll see. And they, they turn out to work in the other direction too. If I have a real uh, an even x of n, it turns out that my Fourier series, the corresponding Fourier series, a sub k will be real and even too. So the, the realness we already saw gives me this conjugate part, but then the even thing makes it real so that its conjugate is equal to itself. Okay, so that's a quick tour. Oh, and one more important one, Parseval's relationship. Can't forget Parseval. Parseval's relationship says if I take uh, 1 over n times the sum over one period of the magnitude squared of the time signal, this one isn't a correspondence. It's, it's the only one that's actual a direct equality. It says I get exactly the same thing if I take the magnitude squared of the a sub k's and add those over one period. And what this is essentially saying is that I have the same amount of energy in the signal, whether I, if I add up over one period in time or one period in frequency, whether I think about one time sample at a time or one frequency sample at a time, the signal has the same energy, which sort of to connect it back to the wooden blocks at the start, it's say, like saying the block has the same volume to it no matter which side I look at. Right, no matter which perspective I take, the underlying block has the same volume of wood in it. Parseval's is sort of saying no matter which perspective you take, time or frequency, the signal has the same energy. All right, so that's uh, a good overview of some of the SIT properties. There are a lot more. You can find tables and textbooks that go on. Um, they go on through, through other properties. I haven't nearly come close to exhausting them, but I've given you a flavor of some of them. And, uh, and, then, and then there's a companion video to this that will show you how we can use these uh, to make our lives easier finding Fourier series. That if I, if I have to find the Fourier series for a new signal, and I can use one of these properties to connect it to a, se the, a, a signal whose Fourier series I already know, I can find it much easier than starting from scratch and going through the sums again. So that's one of the big uh, advantages of mastering these Fourier series things, Fourier series properties, is they let us find ways to find the Fourier series of new signals uh, much easier when I can connect them to the signals where I already know the Fourier series. All right, so that's all for today's video. I will catch you next time. Talk to you later.